hundreds of millions of years before the human adventure began, the Earth was a lifeless, fiery mass whirling in timeless infinity. Our minds cannot grasp the ages during which the Earth's surface cooled, all the while buckling and warping into vast plateaus and depressions that became continents and oceans. We are filled with inexpressible awe when we contemplate the fact that within this volcanic desolation lay the seeds of life. They gradually impregnated the sea with myriads of moving things. They set the air swarming with flying creatures and clothed the barren land with green meadows, forests, and jungles. Through this developing world moved an infinite variety of life, including beasts so gigantic that their very size doomed them to slow extinction. For the habits and even the existence of all these living things were profoundly influenced by mysterious rhythmic forces which at tremendous intervals changed the climate of half the globe from tropic summer to arctic winter. These forces sent vast sheets of ice, sometimes more than a mile thick, relentlessly creeping across the temperate zones, scouring and leveling as they moved. When the human story began several million years ago, the earth was already incalculably old. In those days, there roamed this untamed world, a creature destined to grope his way upward out of the jungle and to emerge victorious from a deadly struggle with his ferocious animal rivals. Physically and mentally, this creature rose to supremacy above all others. He became the only mammal to overcome the fear of fire. He saw fire bursting from volcanoes or beheld jagged fingers of flame descending from the clouds to ignite whole forests. Although gradually he himself learned to kindle and to control fire, it remained for him a mysterious element which he grew to worship. Fire became a part of his earliest religion and increasingly contributed to his mastery of the world. He learned to use heavy wooden clubs and crude stones as weapons and then to shape such stones. He discovered that flint especially could be chipped and flaked into fist hatchets and knives. He became the earliest implement-making creature. Such age-long discipline of thumb and fingers developed the most marvelous of all instruments, the human hand. This in itself would have made him king of the jungle. But his supremacy was assured by his acquired ability to convey ideas with his voice. Certain vocal sounds began to designate his needs and simplest acts. Through ages of repetition, these sounds gradually became words and thus began language. So, during more than a million years of development, this jungle creature had become man. The combination of his unrivaled hands with his ability to speak and the increased brain capacity of his skull made him supreme. Compared with man's age, civilization as we know it is still at the dawn and our own times are but an instant. No one can foretell what the full noonday of man's career will bring forth. We know only that the human adventure is already a tale of victorious accomplishment. It seems reasonable to believe that the promise of man's future lies in the story of his past. Where shall we learn the story of man's conquest of civilization? Today there stands at the University of Chicago the Oriental Institute, the first laboratory ever established for the study of the most remarkable process known to us in the universe, the rise of man from savagery to civilization. It was created in 1919 by Dr. James Henry Breasted, its first director, with funds originally contributed by John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Subsequently, it has been supported by the International and General Education Boards and by the Rockefeller Foundation. From this American base have been sent out some 14 expeditions strategically distributed through the lands where civilization first arose. Egypt, Palestine, Syria, Anatolia, Assyria, Babylonia, and Persia. In Africa, civilization first appeared in the Nile Valley. In Western Asia, it first developed in this farming and grazing belt, which Dr. Breasted has named the Fertile Crescent. Before we ourselves visit these expeditions, 
he will briefly explain to us how modern science is able to recover and interpret the lost story of the origins of civilization. Our civilization of today is an inheritance, a vast and richly varied accumulation of experience acquired gradually and by arduous struggle through the countless ages of the human past. Standing barehanded in the jungle, our earliest ancestor was obliged to acquire his experience to create his own first experience. There has always been a first time in man's past for every acquisition which we of today accept as a matter of course. Largely owing to favorable uh, geographic conditions, civilization first arose in the Near East. We shall take you there presently, <coughs> beginning with Cairo in northeastern Africa and going thence by airplane through Egypt into Western Asia to the lands uh, in and adjoining the Fertile Crescent. You will watch the expeditions of the Oriental Institute actually engaged in the process of recovering the long lost story of human beginnings. You will see them digging deep into mounds of ancient ruins, once prosperous cities, at the bottom of which they find flint implements like these. For the prehistoric peoples all started from scratch with their stone tools and weapons in their hands. Man is the earliest known uh, implement-making creature first revealed to us in these stone tools and weapons. His progress from the crudest of them in stage after stage of slowly advancing craftsmanship to the finest of all flint tools occupied probably a million years. In Egypt, we find the earliest of these uh, flint implements deeply embedded in the geological structure of the Nile Valley and on the adjacent Sahara Plateau, they may still be picked up in great numbers where the prehistoric hunters of the old Stone Age uh, lost and left them lying. Now, when these hunters of some eight or 10,000 years ago had advanced to the production of magnificent flint knives like these, they were already beginning to make the transition from the roving life of the hunter to the settled life of agriculture. You see here a specimen of early wheat which was lying in an Egyptian granary, an ancient Egyptian granary in the days of Joseph's brethren when they went down into Egypt to buy grain. And indeed, it might have been bought by them. Grain was man's first portable wealth and it carried him a long way on the road toward civilization. His next great step forward was the discovery of metal. You see here the earliest known implement of metal. It is a copper needle, which was excavated from a burial in early Egypt, dating from not less than 6,000 years ago. Along with cattle breeding, the uh, introduction of the horse meant an important forward step in men's advance. This bronze bit excavated in Western Persia, along with many others, marks the development of horsemanship and the introduction of cavalry, which made possible uh, imperial conquests like those of the Persians and of Alexander the Great. This small carpenter's chisel is an early example of iron found by our in eastern Anatolia, where the Hittites discovered iron uh, about 2000 BC. It was 1000 BC before iron came into common use. The interval between the uh, <coughs> copper needle of the Egyptian and uh, the Hittite iron chisel of about 3000 years was the prelude to our own industrial era, the modern age of steel. When man learned to express his ideas in permanent form with written symbols, he began a new era which uh, transformed human life. 
you see here the hieroglyphic writing of ancient Egypt and here the cuneiform or wedge form writing devised in early Babylonia but used throughout Western Asia. This Assyrian tablet is inscribed on both sides with nearly 350 lines of cuneiform writing, recounting in summary the reigns of some 95 Assyrian kings. It covers about 1,500 years of human history, ending in the 8th century before Christ, and its beginning discloses to us the earliest known kings of Assyria. You see it here in its original packing, just as it reached us from our excavations uh, at Korsabad, which you will presently visit. Now, while all these acquisitions were going on, there was a marked development of business and economic life. The Babylonians were the first uh, great international merchants. They not only invented the whole idea of credit, but they also devised the earliest known uh, documentary devices for making uh, credit uh, practically operative. You see here a tablet which was sent six or eight hundred miles across the hills of uh, Western Asia, and when it arrived at its distant destination, it was good for a cargo of merchandise, just as your modern bank draft sent to a distant city is good for a certain sum of money. Thus were laid the foundations for the economic life of modern society. But uh, material possessions, cattle and grain, metal and ships, were not enough. Sound business, international relations, and the functions of society as a whole are built up on character. You see here, in this tattered sheet of Egyptian papyrus, the oldest example of paper in the Western Hemisphere. Some 4,300 years ago, the pen of an Egyptian scribe traced these lines in black ink, proclaiming for the first time moral responsibility and man's belief that uh, blessed life in the next world must be dependent upon a morally worthy life in this. To Egypt we owe the dawn of conscience and the earliest visions of character as a social force. Out of the Near East as a whole, likewise, came the uh, great religions of the Western world and also the beginnings of science, astronomy and medicine, art and architecture, literature and music. As we look back into the deep vista of human development, we discern that the Stone Age was uh, the prologue of a majestic drama of which the four world empires of Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia and Persia were the four great acts. Persia was the earliest and the only nation to conquer all the great nations of the early East. Under Persian sovereignty, the vast structure of Oriental civilization arose in all its final grandeur. It culminated in great forces like Christianity, which moving slowly westward for over 2,000 years crossed Europe and still continue to shape our lives today. And now as we visit the buried cities <coughs> of the ancient East, do not burden your memories with a mass of dates, nor confuse your minds with the glimpses of lesser civilizations on the fringes of the great world empires. Only remember that uh, civilization dawned about 4000 BC that is to say, about 6,000 years ago, the Near East began to witness the premiere of a great drama for which mankind had been in training for over a million years. As we traverse together the great stage upon which our earliest predecessors played, let us remember that like every generation since theirs, we are the current cast still continuing to play our part in the never-ending drama of the human adventure. Our air tour of the lands where civilization first arose begins at Cairo near the western tip of the Fertile Crescent. The plane carries extra drinking water and iron rations against forced landings. It will cover distances in a few hours which the ancients computed in weary months.
From the air above the River Nile, modern Cairo reminds one of some great city of Europe. But with more than a million inhabitants, it is both the largest city in Africa and the largest Muslim city in the world. Near Cairo, the Suez Canal cuts the land route between Africa and Asia. Through Cairo pass the air routes linking Europe with South Africa and the Orient. The famous citadel, crowned by the mosque of Muhammad Ali, was built of facing blocks taken from the Pyramid of Giza by the famous Saladin and the Arab conquerors of Egypt, beginning in the 12th century AD. Since leaving Cairo, we begin to realize the extent and significance of this great Nile Valley. It is a winding ribbon of rich green fields, bounded by waterless desert on both sides. This verdure grows on soil carried down from the plateau of Abyssinia by the Blue Nile, the eastern tributary of the Great River. The Nile itself wanders northward for over 4,000 miles and is the only stream leading from inner Africa to the Mediterranean. How many of us realize that several hundred thousand years ago, the Great Sahara Desert, occupying nearly one third of Africa, was clothed with plentiful vegetation, including many forests? Through these verdure covered regions roamed a primitive race of Stone Age hunters. But gradually the climate changed, rainfall ceased, and every vestige of verdure disappeared. The Stone Age hunters retreated to the one remaining water supply, the Nile Valley. There they became the remote ancestors of the Egyptian pyramid builders. The ancient Greeks included the pyramids of Giza among the seven wonders of the world. Pharaohs who refused to be daunted by death built these colossal royal tombs in the 29th and 28th centuries before Christ. But inevitably, they fell prey to tomb robbers who despoiled them of the magnificent furniture and incredible riches buried with the royal mummies. The pyramids, largest masonry structures ever erected by ancient man stand today as tragically futile efforts to win immortality by material power. A few miles farther south among the palms below is the site of ancient Memphis. That odd shaped building is a headquarters built by the Oriental Institute for an expedition working in the neighboring ancient Egyptian cemetery called Saqqara, where from 3000 years BC onwards, the people of Memphis buried their dead. The renowned Step Pyramid stands among scores of smaller limestone tombs. It was built by the world's first architect in stone masonry and is the earliest great masonry superstructure in the world, the first pyramid tomb of a pharaoh. These smaller tombs contain rooms on whose walls are carved superb painted reliefs, the oldest known examples of sculpture and painting in historic times, and the oldest surviving portrayals of developing human life. The ancient Egyptian believed that his existence after death was a continuation of his customary life on earth. His tombs were therefore decorated with scenes depicting all the daily activities of his household. The Oriental Institute staff is at work in the tomb of Meruruka, one of the great lords of Memphis. The colors of many reliefs are still bright because these tombs were buried beneath the protecting sands blown in from the western desert until they were excavated a few years ago. Meraruka, whose limestone statue gazes at us from his niche, would be astonished to watch these modern architects and artists copying his tomb for publication nearly 5,000 years after his death. For it is the artistry and historical importance of these unsurpassed wall reliefs, and not the good deeds and social prestige they record, which have brought him immortality beyond his dreams. About 360 air miles southward is ancient Thebes, one time capital of the Egyptian empire today called Luxor. Everywhere along the river banks are ancient buildings and ruins bearing evidence of the long ages during which mankind developed under the favorable conditions of this unique valley. These modern buildings at Luxor on the east bank of the Nile house the Oriental Institute's largest expedition, a permanent Near Eastern base. Its staff is recording the vast library of historical records inscribed on the walls of the enormous Theban temples, including the neighboring temple of Karnak before us. On the west bank of the river toward which we are now looking 
It is also recording this temple of Medinet Habu in the midst of what became a city of the dead. For when he died, a citizen of ancient Thebes was laid to rest in these limestone cliffs, behind which lay the land of the setting sun where departed souls were thought to dwell. Like those at Saqqara, the scenes sculptured upon yonder tomb and temple walls portray the lives and deeds of pharaohs and their subjects. The lofty cliff behind Medina Tabu forms the east side of the valley of the king's tombs. A black speck in the glaring white road is one of the expedition's cars moving toward Tutankhamun's tomb and the more than two score other royal tombs in this silent, age-old valley. The tombs seem to us very old, yet on the plateau where we stand, we can pick up the flint implements of men who lived several hundred thousand years before these pharaohs ruled. The city of the living was chiefly on the east bank and surrounded the awe-inspiring temple of Amon at Karnak. Its great columned hall with its clear story windows is the architectural ancestor of the medieval basilica churches of Europe. The mighty main hall was once roofed over so that the tops of the columns were lost in a cathedral-like twilight. Religious processions led by chanting priests with the blue mist of incense rising above them must for centuries have passed along these aisles. The monumental buildings of Karnak are the witnesses of a new age of man, for the pharaohs who raised them conquered Western Asia and transformed Egypt from a kingdom into the first world empire. With them began imperialism. On the top of each of these columns, a hundred men could stand. In a colonnade of this vast temple of Amon, the Egyptian queen Hatshepsut in the 15th century BC commemorated her royal jubilee by erecting a pair of obelisks. The obelisks now standing in Constantinople, Rome, Paris, London and New York were brought there from Egypt. But this survivor of Queen Hatshepsut's pair is one of the largest single shafts of stone ever quarried. The four sides are carved with inscriptions extending entirely across its wide base. They describe the Queen's great achievements and tell how her engineers quarried out a pair of these colossal shafts in only seven months. The inscriptions continue to its top, a height of 97 and a half feet. Think of the engineering involved in cutting out this gigantic block and transporting it 140 miles downriver from the Aswan granite quarries to Luxor. These Aswan quarries are a little over an hour by air southward from Luxor. In their midst is still lying an even larger but unfinished obelisk. All but one of the four sides had been roughly cut out when the engineers discovered a hidden flaw or crack. This shaft, 135 feet long and weighing 1,100 tons or as much as a 12-car Pullman train, is the largest block ever quarried by human hands. That dark, irregular line is the flaw, which the ancient engineers chipped out to determine its extent. The actual quarrying was probably done by slave labor. The great trenches on each side of the obelisk were sunk by pounding the granite with ball hammers of dolerite, a stone harder than the granite. When work on the obelisk was abandoned, the slaves left their dolerite hammers lying at the bottom of the trench where excavators found them. Having no handles, they were held between a workman's two hands while he literally pulverized the granite in the slowly deepening trench. The lives of slaves were cheap in those days. The Amon Temple of Karnak was begun in the 20th century BC, and though its construction continued intermittently for almost 2,000 years, that is, into the age of the famous Ptolemies, the building was never completed. About 1,200 years before Christ, Ramses III built this smaller temple which some of the expedition staff are now entering. The expedition's method of making facsimile copies of all inscriptions and relief sculptures is a combination of photography and drawing. The process of checking these copies with the actual walls is strenuous exercise, 
what appears to be the Luxor Fire Department in rehearsal is a group of scientific workers who can read the ancient hieroglyphs. They are called epigraphers and are hard at work comparing the expedition artist's India ink drawings with the original wall. Thousands on thousands of square feet of inscribed walls in varying states of disrepair are thus checked. You may properly ask, why all this effort? The answer is simple. The records on these ancient buildings are the raw material of which history is made. They have never been properly copied and are steadily weathering, disintegrating, and becoming illegible. Unless preserved in this way, these priceless historical records will be irretrievably lost. The temple record would be incomplete without an architectural survey. From the top of the entrance gate at Medina Tabu, we look down upon the first ground plan of a pharaoh's palace ever disclosed by modern excavators. The expedition found only the bases of the walls surviving and built these up with low walls of burned brick. From the adjacent temple, a staff member crosses a corner of what was the colonnaded audience hall. He walks along the low wall, passing first a storage room or vault, and then the pharaoh's private dressing room with its connected bathroom. Beyond him, in a row, are the bedroom-bathroom suites of the pharaoh's three harem favorites. From the rear wall, our guide looks down on the stone steps of the dais for the royal throne, just obtruding from shadow. At the left corner is the royal bedroom, with another dais and stone steps up which the pharaoh climbed into bed. Finally, the staff member passes a private hallway leading both to the audience hall and to the ladies' apartments a delicate blending of business and pleasure. This small palace was used only for brief visits on ceremonial occasions. At the corners of important buildings, the ancient Egyptians used to place foundation deposits, a practice out of which grew our cornerstone custom. The workmen before us have just found such a deposit. It contains models of construction tools, pottery jars, miniature bricks of exquisite blue faience, and other tokens meant to ensure the completed structure all good fortune we carry with us from Luxor a memorable impression of this unique expedition. In the building on the left are the drafting rooms and the library, open to visiting scholars and students from all over the world. On the right are the residence quarters of the scientific staff. There is an atmosphere of cosmopolitan hospitality about this California Spanish building with its patio and colorful fountain. As we leave for our plane, we catch a last view framed by the arcade, past which glides silently, a Latin rigged Nile boat drifting down the current with a faint breath of breeze. The Egyptian world empire ruled Palestine, whose ancient peoples were also repeatedly conquered by Babylonia, Assyria, and other neighboring powers. We fly 500 miles northeastward, passing over Jerusalem, the Jordan Valley, and the seaport of Haifa to Megiddo, called Armageddon in the New Testament. The streets and houses of modern Jerusalem resemble a subdivision in Southern California and hardly suggest the golden city of tradition. The Crusaders enclosed the old Jerusalem with a wall just appearing at the left. In the sacred temple area where Jesus taught and from which he drove the money changers stands today the Mosque of Omar, now before us. Just outside the city is the new British residency, home of the High Commissioner. Palestine has had a varied experience of foreign rule under Egyptians, Greeks, Persians, Romans, Arabs, and Turks. Today it is a British mandate. A few miles eastward we cross the winding Jordan, flowing at 1,300 feet below sea level into the lowest chasm in the world which is filled by the Dead Sea. When Field Marshal Lord Allenby was conquering Palestine in 1918, he puzzled the British War Office with a cable reporting that his planes flying 600 feet below sea level bombed the enemy along the Jordan. From this valley, we swing northward, passing over Haifa, seaport of Palestine, on our way to Megiddo, 19 miles by road from the Mediterranean. Megiddo is literally a lair cake of ancient cities, one built upon another as its predecessor was destroyed by war or as houses merely crumbled with age, fell down, and were rebuilt. 
One by one, the Oriental Institute's Megiddo expedition is stripping off these layers. Each removal reveals an earlier age. Undoubtedly, a Stone Age settlement awaits exposure at the very bottom. For Stone Age men lived among these hills 100,000 years before the Hebrews entered Palestine. The Silver Baloo. This ancient place was the capital of a powerful little kingdom. It dominated both the biblical plain of Esdrelon or Megiddo and the famous pass of Megiddo through the Carmel range of hills running transversely across Palestine. Through this pass marched the great armies of the ancient world going from Africa to invade Asia or vice versa. In 1918, Field Marshal Lord Allenby sent 20,000 cavalry through it in a single night. For thousands of years, bands have worn deeper this narrow trail over the Carmel Ridge. The nations at various times controlling Megiddo, Hebrews, Egyptians, and others, exacted their tribute of those who came by. The city thus far disclosed by the excavations is of Solomon's time, that is, from 1000 BC onward. At several points, men are completing a record of this level. The foremen over the actual diggers, men from Upper Egypt, whom the expedition imports into Palestine each season from the same village as those we watched at Luxor. But here, the baskets are usually carried by native women of the region. When the load in a dump car is emptied, it slides quickly to the bottom of a chute into another waiting car, which carries it out to the end of the ever-growing dump. The stones from the ancient ruins go booming and clattering down another chute and come tumbling out upon a bed of steel rail. In a short time, this debris, the wreckage of Solomon's city, will be covered with weeds and wild flowers. In the enormous pit before us was discovered an ancient winding staircase descending 120 feet to a horizontal tunnel 165 feet long. This led to a cavern containing a spring, Megiddo's water supply, especially during siege. The stairs at several points have been restored by the expedition. This is the largest ancient work of engineering yet found in Palestine and perhaps antedates the Hebrews themselves. In sharp contrast is the delicate task of carefully clearing and recording a very early tomb just outside the ancient city at the base of the mound. Lying about in this cave burial are the skulls of men who walked the streets of the city above when it was first being attacked by the earliest Hebrew invaders of Palestine. We are among the very first modern people to descend into this rock-hewn tomb chamber 12 feet underground, dating from the late Bronze Age, somewhere between 16 and 1300 BC. Here is still lying the burial equipment of a Canaanite of that time. It required the greatest patience and care to clear away the rubbish which covered all these objects. This bronze dagger was once grasped in a sturdy Canaanite fist, and its blade may have pierced the breast of a Hebrew invader of Palestine nearly 3,500 years ago. The pottery vessels covering every square inch of the floor have already been carefully photographed in place. That small opening at the back is the only entrance to the tomb. Now follows a systematic routine of registration. The objects are removed from the tomb, placed in baskets tagged with the exact location of the find, and taken to the expedition headquarters. Freshly discovered objects are treated much like newly arrested prisoners brought into a detective bureau for identification. Every known fact about the discovery of the object is copied from the basket tag and a serial number is placed on each separate piece. Everything is photographed in detail, and if it had fingers, their prints would be taken. This pottery jug is subjected to an ingenious device which instantly registers its shape. Archaeologists all over the world are able to determine the age and origin of ancient pottery by its shape and quality. Finally, all these data are entered in the expedition's golden book, the field register, which lists every object found at Megiddo since the beginning of operations. In the patio sits Ali, an adept Egyptian, playing with his own special jigsaw puzzle. He is assembling and bending broken pots so that the scientific staff can date the levels in which they are found. Balloon ascensions are regular routine for the Megiddo expedition. The captive balloon is taken from its hangar to be sent aloft with a camera equipped with an electrically controlled shutter for making mosaic air maps of the progress of the excavation. The balloon is brought up the side of the mound through the ancient gate of Solomon City, and as it happens, 
to the site of the stables where Solomon kept more than 200 of his blooded horses, for among other things, he was a famous horse trader. Behind the men and the balloon can be seen the hitching posts for tying the halters. Still in place between these posts is a stone manger like that in which the child Jesus must have slept in the stable at Bethlehem. A small scale model suggests how the stables must have appeared in Solomon's time, about 950 BC. The model horses in their stalls and other details have been reconstructed in scale with the actual discovery. The design of the roofs and doors is based on reliable evidence. The balloon is ready. Away it goes to make a daily quota of negatives. By fitting together a whole set of these air views, the expedition produces an air map of every level exposed by excavation. In honor of our visit, the expedition declares one of those half holidays periodically granted to the local workers. They and their children receive food, toys, and sweets. The feast is preceded by a curious ancient Egyptian game of single stick staged by the Egyptian foreman. No one is hurt, no one seems to win or lose, and whatever point there may be to this sport remains a mystery to us. At the sight of bowls of boiled rice, the youngsters' table manners vanish and pandemonium reigns. They stuff their little faces with fistfuls of rice and the Egyptian foreman try vainly to preserve order. When sweets are tossed among them, the crowd, children and adults alike, surges back and forth till the sweets are gone and rapacity gives way to dancing. The leader of the dance always carries a handkerchief trimmed with beads, here being held by the kitchen boy in his white apron. This ballet performance is Megiddo's farewell gesture as we leave Palestine farthest north in flight into history. The ancient neighbors of the Hittites on the east were the Assyrians who created the second world empire. To reach their country we fly over the forbidding Taurus mountains and warlike Kurdistan to modern Mosul. Suddenly the desert gives way to the green fields and foothills of northern Iraq ancient Mesopotamia. The largest city of this region is Mosul, a grandchild many times removed of biblical Nineveh beside the Tigris River. The west end of the bridge has been lengthened with a wooden extension because, like all north and south rivers, the Tigris has responded to the Earth's spinning motion by cutting deeply into its western bank. Some distance east of the present Tigris is the actual site of mighty Nineveh, capital of Assyria. The river once washed the western walls of the huge city. Those pockmarks in the mound betray illicit digging by modern natives searching for antiquities. The wider trenches at the far end mark the efforts of modern archaeologists to uncover this tremendous place. Fifteen miles north of Mosul lies the little adobe village of Korsabad. In the distance are the Kurdish mountains. The Iraq expedition's northern headquarters is this rebuilt thatch-roofed house near the village. At Khorsabad toward 720 BC, the Assyrian emperor Sargon II founded a city a mile square. Here he built himself a vast palace of stone and brick, covering a terrace of about 25 acres. But the king reigned only 17 years, and the place hardly outlived its founder. The great buildings collapsed and for 2,600 years lay forgotten beneath yonder mound in the green rolling plain. About 90 years ago, a French scientist named Plus began its excavation and today the Oriental Institute is completing the unfinished task. Men hack out the age-hardened earth. As the trenches deepen, we can see that the palace walls reproduced in mud brick the wood and wattle construction of much earlier times. The main entrances were adorned with arches faced with burned brick, glazed in bright colors now much faded, depicting lions and other animals in balanced arrangement. 
At one entrance, the expedition has uncovered an enormous stone threshold. Its inscription in beautifully cut cuneiform signs records with much bombast and flowery language Sargon's glowing opinion of himself and his deeds. The last stages of excavation require great care. The native workmen are using knives and brushes in clearing the ancient pavement before the palace gates. In another trench, a small boy is lifting out a paving slab. It was stamped with the seal of the Emperor Sargon II, which gives his name and titles. Before the slab was dried and baked, a stray dog of about 720 BC trod upon it and left his signature beside that of his sovereign emperor. The size of the monarch's bathroom is a blow to American pride, but slightly un-American are the sculptured wall reliefs depicting long-haired eunuchs, the traditional servants of the emperor. The floor is recessed for the royal bathtub, which was absolutely modern in shape. The bathtub, long since lost or stolen, may have been of bronze or even precious metal. On these carved stone fragments are visible the legs of a magnificent winged bull, such as guarded each side of the main entrance to Sargon's palace. They represented Assyrian divinities, and in this instance, their heads were probably portraits of the emperor Sargon II. This reconstruction by Monsieur Plas is an attempt to show how the gateway must have looked with the stone bulls in their original positions. In the Oriental Institute's American headquarters at Chicago stands the largest known example of these extraordinary sculptures. It was presented by the Iraq government to the Oriental Institute, which shipped it to America in more than a dozen great fragments weighing together about 40 tons. The largest piece, weighing 19 tons crated, had to be especially routed from New York to Chicago because it was too wide for tunnels and bridges. 30 miles northeast by air from Baghdad at Tel Azmar stands the main base of the Oriental Institute Iraq expedition, now clearing two of the four ancient cities in its Babylonian concession. This isolated expedition house is a solitary outpost of the new world on the frontiers of the past. During the rainy season, when the plain becomes a sea of mud, the expedition is marooned for a fortnight at a time, and the staff goes on iron rations. Despite the rain, water is scarce, and has to be hauled by this truck from a canal 12 miles away. Tel Azmar was the capital city of a Babylonian state extending from the Persian border to the region of Baghdad. 4,000 years ago, this now desolate land was green and flourishing, and generations of kings ruled here until at least 2000 BC. Like all humans, the Babylonians thought of themselves as permanent, but they were only another incident in the human adventure. Ages of winter rainy seasons have covered this ancient city with a great adobe pancake made of its own disintegrated buildings. But by careful picking, scraping, and brushing, it is possible to remove this softer mud and lay bare the harder ancient walls and streets. You ask, how do we know the age of this place, the names of its kings, the habits and customs of its people? Each of these bricks from the excavations is stamped, just as at Khorsabad, with the name and title of the king who ruled when this building was erected. From inscribed tablets mentioning eclipses of the sun and moon, a series of important dates has been established. The Babylonians had no paper, so with a little bamboo stick or stylus, they imprinted their cuneiform signs on soft clay tablets, which were then dried or slightly baked. This workman is just recovering such a tablet. He removes it with utmost care because most of these tablets were only dried or were insufficiently baked, and when found today are ready to crumble. When rebaked in the expedition's specially constructed oil-burning furnace, they are permanently hardened. By studying thousands of these tablets, the scientific staff can reconstruct a detailed picture of the daily life of this ancient city. They are an amazing record of business. They give us price levels over a period of 3,000 years, an item of human experience which modern economists cannot find anywhere else. They contain law court proceedings, international treaties, astronomical records, private contracts, temple and household accounts, and even personal letters. 
the expeditions employ every possible modern mechanical or scientific device. For instance, a compressed air paint sprayer blows away the dust in the final stages of excavating the streets and houses. The ancient sun-dried bricks are like those made in identical fashion by modern workmen for the expedition's buildings. The trick of adding straw is more than 5,000 years old. Like the Assyrians, the Babylonians had their bathrooms and toilets with drainage systems emptying into sewers beneath the streets. These even had manholes. The small boy has been clearing a length of the most ancient sewer ever found, which many a modern town would be proud to own. Beer occupied an important place in the diet of Babylonian citizens. They stored it in great jars, like these. In this temple, the Babylonians worshipped images of the state gods, especially the god of war. Excavation has brought to light many heads of these once sacred images, which are among the oldest sculptures in the world, and naively portray ancient Babylonian types as divinities. It is a far cry from the highly organized society which once ebbed and flowed through this ancient place to the simple present-day workers flocking toward the expedition building to receive their weekly wages. They chant as they go, a leader singing the verse of their payday song. Every man receives a ticket bearing his name together with a number and six spaces for daily punching. Every morning the men submit their tickets. On payday, so many holes mean so many days' wages. But no ticket, no wages. The workers are genial rascals with faces full of character and humor. They comprise every type, from shepherd to brigand, and some of them are honest. Today, a violent windstorm has come up, which raises the dust of Iraq to a height of more than 15,000 feet until it obliterates the sky. The cold, grimy blast whips among the men who wrap themselves closely in their camel's hair garments. It renders doubly difficult the duties of the field director and his staff who sit like judges at a trial. The men are given their cash, the old tickets are exchanged for new, and the numbers are checked off. From Iraq, the land where scriptural legend placed the Garden of Eden, our route lies across the northern tip of the Persian Gulf and over the Persian mountains to Shiraz and mighty Persepolis, one-time residents of the Persian emperors. Southward from Baghdad looms a great ruin resembling an abandoned Zeppelin hangar. It is the famous Arch of Tessiphon, dating from early Christian times, a marvelous example of human ingenuity which has puzzled engineers throughout the world. With its span of 84 feet and height of over 100, it has weathered the storms of nearly 2,000 years. More than 500 miles southeastward, we begin to climb to an altitude of 12,000 feet until we glide at last across the tumbled desolation of the Persian mountains. They stand like a mighty barrier flung down by angry nature as a bulwark to protect the great plateau where Cyrus and Darius trained the armies with which they conquered the ancient world. Persia lies spread below us like some sleeping giant whose sudden stirring might send us like an insect spinning to destruction among these barren peaks and desolate shadow-filled gorges. The altimeter now reads 14,000 feet, and the even drone of our motors is music to us. At last, the modern city of Shiraz appears on the plateau. One can barely discern formal gardens with quiet pools and tall cypresses. It reminds one of delicate Persian miniatures and of Omar Khayyam. At Persepolis, a silver speck appears between the columns of the audience hall where Persian emperors used to sit in royal state. Overhead, our plane sweeps past this capital of the fourth and last ancient oriental empire. What would Darius the Great have said at such a sight? For us, at a height of a thousand feet, the great terrace presents a grand array of palaces and halls of state. The Oriental Institute's Persian expedition has restored as its headquarters that large building in the upper background, which was the harem palace of Darius and Xerxes. 
Alexander the Great, who in 331 BC conquered Persia and burned Persepolis, would have marveled at the sight of our plane coming in over the very ground upon which his Macedonian veterans must have camped more than 2,200 years ago. The tremendous scale on which this Versailles of the ancient world was planned and built was in keeping with the vision of its builders as they dreamed of greater empires. Some of the blocks in this 50-foot terrace wall weigh over 40 tons and are taller than the native Persian on his donkey jogging along a road that emperors traveled. From this imposing stronghold, those same emperors watched their troops proudly passing in review upon the plain beneath. Persia's subject nations never supposed these mighty walls would long outlive the greatest empire the ancient world had yet beheld. Whoever climbed the grand staircase to seek admission at the gate of Xerxes had need of flawless credentials, for they were inspected by the picked troops who guarded the palaces, a regiment called the Immortals, famous in the annals of Persian conquest. The columns are all that remains of their guard room, which was attached to the gate. The road running north from the Persian Gulf comes straight as an arrow toward Persepolis, across the plain, over a mile above sea level. Those far off mountains rise almost as high again. Imagine this terrace when the halls and palaces were in their glory. After restoration of the harem palace of Darius had been half completed by the Oriental Institute, the building looked like this. The windows and doors of all Persepolis buildings were of stone, but the main body of the walls was of massive adobe. When Alexander came marching from the ancient west and destroyed Persepolis, this six-ton lintel block came crashing down with roofs and walls. Now, after more than 2,000 years, the peaceful forces of modern science from the new west are hoisting it back into place again. The energetic gentlemen of the chorus who are pulling at the ropes in Gilbert and Sullivan style have only the vaguest idea of what is going on, but they get regular pay for it, so they haul away with such goodwill as Allah has given them. Gradually, the block is brought to the right level and at last settles almost into its appointed place. A jimmy will do the rest. A season's work has effected a great change in this building. The adobe walls have been rebuilt. Wooden columns, those in the original structure, have been re-erected in the entrance courts. And the whole place has been roofed over. 2,400 years ago, when Darius the Great provided this palace for his charming favorites, his carpenters use the same type of saw which these workmen are employing today. The expedition's chickens are wandering about in what was the main hall of the palace of Xerxes. How are the mighty fallen? Chickens originally reached Persia in the days of Persepolis, brought in by commerce from India and the Far East. The Persians imported them into the Mediterranean world. These splendid carvings on the north staircase to the audience hall of Darius, depicting a procession of tribute bearers, were not thoroughly buried by Alexander's destruction. Despite centuries of exposure, even the needles are discernible in the carving of a cedar from the forests once covering the Persian mountains. Camel bells from caravans of beasts like this still break the brooding silence of Persepolis. Similar sculptures were almost certain to be found beneath the grassy mounds overlying most of the terrace. But no one dreamed of the regal splendors which their excavation would reveal to the world. For more than 22 centuries, the capital of the Persian Empire they neglected. Then in 1931, the Oriental Institute received the concession to excavate and restore Persepolis. After restoring the Harem Palace, the expedition began excavating the Royal Audience Hall of Darius the Great. A great trench was dug in the area between the cluster of columns and the ruins just below us, where there was suspected to be another staircase. The excavation of this trench has settled a question debated for centuries, namely whether Alexander burned Persepolis. These cars are carrying away debris beneath which was found a thick layer of ashes and charcoal immediately over the ruins. They are the ashes of the cedar roofs which came crashing down in flames. The enormous walls tumbled in after them and gradually covered the wreckage with a deep protective layer of solid adobe. To Alexander's ruthlessness, 
we indirectly owe the perfect preservation of these superlative sculptures. The reliefs before us adorn a stately double stairway and depict a tremendous celebration in honor of the emperor on New Year's Day or March 21st of the Persian calendar. These rows of figures comprise representatives of all the ancient oriental civilizations, here rubbing elbows as ambassadors from 25 nations bring gifts of every description to the emperor, gold and silver vessels, fine raiment, superb horses, semi-precious stones, and in one case, as indicated by the cane, a sumptuous throne or chair. These foreign tribute bearers, palace guards, charioteers, Persians, Medians, and Susians, and countless others, compose a magnificent array in which the detail of the carving often equals the delicacy of a cameo. At the far end of the great trench, the excavations have just laid bare an often repeated scene of a lion attacking a bull. The ferocity of the lion and the terror of the victim are superbly portrayed. But in this profile view of the bull, the ancient artist showed only one horn because the nearer one hid the farther one. Later peoples failed to understand this. And thus began the legend of the lion and the unicorn. The architectural layout of Persepolis was carefully planned with practical and artistic foresight. This large stairway cut into the bedrock led to several miles of tunnels, forming an immense subterranean drainage system, the excavation of which has proved that the ancient engineers and architects knew in advance where and how each building was to stand. The workers with their clumsy footwear go galumping up and down, carrying out the earth which through the ages has largely filled the dark tunnels below. Out in the plain only two miles away, the expedition has found a Stone Age village from which the Persepolis Terrace is clearly visible in the distance. Little villages like this were inhabited by the predecessors of the Persian emperors 3,500 years before Persepolis was built. The genius of these emperors did not develop in one or two generations, but required centuries of ripening. When Darius the Great was in his glory, this settlement had long since become an unnoticed mound. So it remained until the Oriental Institute undertook its excavation. We shall probably never know what befell the inhabitants when they abandoned the village about 6,000 years ago. The circular bake oven or kill in the foreground might have been built only yesterday. These household utensils of baked clay were found lying about just as they were left some of them even containing meat bones and other evidences of the last meal. So far as we know, these clay vessels are among the earliest painted pottery ever discovered. They reveal a remarkable sense of design, almost equaling that of our own American Indians 5,000 years later. It is a marvelous development, this transformation of simple Stone Age villagers into empire builders. What inner forces spurred them upward to such pinnacles of power? Why should their paths of glory have led but to the grave? The awe-inspiring tombs of the Persian emperors, carved in the face of a neighboring mountain, were robbed ages ago and now resound with empty echoes. This square masonry tower, according to local legend never confirmed, is the tomb of Zoroaster. The other tombs in this royal cemetery are carved out of the mountain itself, and all have been identified. Next is the tomb of Darius II. The sculptures beneath it date from a much later time. Farther to the right is the tomb of Artaxerxes I. The tremendous carving of a mighty horse and rider dates from Roman times and depicts the Persian king, Shapur I, triumphing over the Roman emperor, Valerian. Darius the Great was the first to carve his tomb among these cliffs. It was his imperial vision that founded Persepolis and made the power of Persia a tradition for all time. How trivial seem the modern human figures as they clamber up the face of his tomb. High overhead is sculptured a scene of royal worship. Darius, Xerxes, Zoroaster, like the clang of Persian arms against Macedonian shields, these magic names have come ringing down the centuries. In the sunlit silence, 
there steals over us a sense of the presence of greatness which will never die and of the utter loneliness of immortality. After such communion with the past, we return almost eagerly to the world of the living in the hubbub of Persepolis. The day's work is over and the workmen await dismissal by their native foreman. He shouts the line of a song always sung when work is done and they chant a reply. The moment they are dismissed, their sluggishness disappears like magic and they come pouring out of the trench and running pell-mell helter-skelter to their villages scattered far off across the plain. Most of these men get up well before dawn and walk many miles at a much slower pace than this in order to begin work at sunrise. The crooping sunset clouds above Persepolis give warning that our own day too is done. We linger one last moment in the palace of Darius. It frames the cluster of noble columns still standing in the imperial audience hall. So they have stood for more than a score of centuries like soldiers at attention, the brave and shattered remnants of those same immortals who guarded the lives of the emperors. A dreamlike beauty haunts this glorious place. Except perhaps for the Acropolis at Athens, Persepolis seems to us the most majestic, dramatic sight of all antiquity. Ages of storms have taken their toll of these slender columns, and earthquakes have dashed to earth their capitals carved as crouching bulls. Only this single capital remains. It rests so precariously above us, we almost fear some passing breeze might send it crashing down. <laughs>